CEO of IC, ISC Square, the world's largest non-profit association of certified cybersecurity professionals with more than 300,000 members, associates and candidates across the globe. Uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Rosso. All right. Thank you so much. And it's so wonderful to be here. And thank you to the ANISA organizers for this event to talk about this very important topic. So I wanted to start by just sharing some ideas about the values of frameworks. ISC Squared and some of the other speakers here, our whole businesses are built on frameworks. That's what certifications are. Frameworks provide reliability, um, repeatability, uniformity that allow us as certification bodies to assess somebody's competencies that they can bring to jobs. And the, the ANISA skills framework, cybersecurity skills framework really is focused on job roles and I think has great value. And if I could have two points that you remember from my entire presentation, it's this. This is why frameworks are so important. Cybersecurity is a national defense issue. It is an economic security issue for all the nations that we represent and live in. And, in, and with a global deficit of almost three and a half million cybersecurity professionals, it is imperative that when we are hiring people into jobs, that we are hiring people with the right skill sets because we are handing over our information and systems to them for protection. So frameworks help us do that. The second thing, which ties into the first, is that deficit, that huge deficit we have, we know we can't fill the workforce gap in cybersecurity by the same means by which we have traditionally hired people into cybersecurity. That means we have to look behind, beyond pulling people over from IT and find people from far more diverse backgrounds to bring them in and skill them up to help us secure our information and systems. And what frameworks do is it help us really focus on what are those core competencies required for a specific role. And that helps us reduce bias in our hiring process, which is critical to the job we need to do to fill our cybersecurity workforce needs. Um, so it's, that's where I wanted to start. This shows our global workforce numbers, but I also wanted to share the EU numbers. We estimate the size of the EU workforce to be over 800,000 professionals closing in on 1 million and good growth, 12.3% between 21 and 22. But still, the workforce needs to increase by at least 29% just to meet known demand. Uh, and that's significant. And this is why we care. And this is why the frameworks are important because in the EU, 64% of organizations are saying if our cybersecurity staffing shortages are putting us at extreme or moderate risk, that's 51%, 64% says it puts us at risk overall, 51% says extreme or moderate risk. And more specifically, the things that aren't happening, and this also ties back into the need for skills frameworks, the things that aren't happening because organizations don't have enough cybersecurity staff is they're not spending enough time on proper risk assessment and management. There are oversights to processes and procedures. Organizations are slow to patch critical systems and they're misconfiguring systems. And then above and beyond that, because we know that the solution to our cyber defense is an ecosystem solution, they're not being able to invest enough time in training all the staff in their organization or in training the staff related to specifically to information and system security. So when we know what work's not happening and we can identify the skills required to do that work, that helps us move forward in a, a productive way. One of the, the points that I think is particularly alarming and something that we really need to think about is that 95% of all businesses around the globe with 100 or fewer employees have no information and systems security professionals at all, none. And, and that is alarming because 
I know in the, the country I live in, and I know in many, many other countries around the globe, our economies are driven by small business. And this is telling us that small businesses are un unprotected. And I believe that skills frameworks can help a small business say, hey, what kind of role do I need to hi hire? And then what competencies do I need for that role? All right, so what else do we know about cybersecurity talent and hiring and how the skills framework can perhaps fit into what we're seeing as trends in the marketplace? So one of the most significant trends that we're seeing is people's pathways into cybersecurity are beginning to change. And that is, I mentioned earlier that historically, the majority of people came from IT and moved into cybersecurity. That is still the clear pl plurality of people are coming from IT and moving over, but we're starting to see more individuals, more younger individuals, pursuing an education route into cybersecurity. So while a skills framework can help employers when designing job roles, the skills framework can also help universities as they design their curriculums to help move people from the university study to employability and into jobs. Um, the other thing that we need to pay attention to is that demographics, and these are EU specific, um, demographics. Demographics within the profession are changing as well. So we are seeing more females moving into roles in cybersecurity, which is great to see um, and also helps us as we think about who's the great profile for somebody moving into cybersecurity. We can perhaps move, remove any gender bias we have and really focus on the 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 actual competencies required to do the job. Um, another way that we're seeing EU employers develop talent is through certification is the number one way. And again, certification, it's built on frameworks. They're very specific about what competencies do you need at what level to do what jobs. So while we don't specifically see job role frameworks mentioned here, I think it aligns really nicely with that, knowing that the go-to for employers is certifications. And again, certifications are fully built on skills frameworks. Um, some of the top attributes sought by EU employers when looking for people to, to hire, and we hope that this feeds into the skills frameworks, because skills frameworks should be technical and non-technical skills. Um, our employers are looking for, yes, relevant work experience, but also curiosity and an eagerness to learn, strong problem-solving skills, and as you can see, knowledge of advanced cybersecurity concepts. Um, and, and just cybersecurity activities in general. Again, all of these things that we see the marketplace demanding help fill, feed into our skills framework. More specifically, when we look at what market-driven data that says what we should be looking for in roles, when we're looking at entry and junior level roles, which typically are the roles that can do that work, that's not happening as a result of not having enough cybersecurity staff. We see that the top technical skills, data security, cloud security, security administration, but folks are really starting to focus on the non-technical skills, then train for the technical skills. So the ability to work in a team, ability to work independently, a project management experience, and then the ones that everyone always nods their heads and agrees with, are people who are problem solvers, analytical thinkers, creativity, which to me speaks to problem solving again, critical thinkings, and then have that desire to learn on an ongoing basis. Um, we have aligned, and I'm sure other organizations have as well, we've looked at how the European Cybersecurity Skills Framework aligns to our certification so that we can match them up and we see great complementary activities between them. And that can help employers too, where they can take a robust tool like these job frameworks that, that Anissa has created and we can align them to what are the certifications or what are the degree programs that are out in the marketplace 
that match up with those roles that have been defined by the European Cybersecurity Skills Framework. Just one last thing, and I'm gonna hand off to the wonderful other panelists we have today. I just wanted to share a couple of the initiatives that ISC Squared has underway to help close the workforce gap and help support moving people into careers in cybersecurity um, that will help with this need we have in the EU and also around the world. And number one is in 2022, we introduced a new certification certified in cybersecurity. Um, it's entry level, it's designed for someone with no background in cybersecurity, um, and it gives, it helps built on a framework. It helps gives employers confidence that they can find somebody with the right non-technical skills and personality attributes that the individual has demonstrated the core competencies that would help them be successful in jobs in cybersecurity. And we have made a commitment to offer that program, the online learning and the examination to 1 million individuals across the globe. We already have over 150,000 enrolled in it um, and help them on their path into their careers in cybersecurity. So with that, I will stop and pass off to the next panelist. Thanks for letting me share a little bit. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, thank you very much, Claire. I'm reminding again for those who uh, are late comer, uh, comers that you can uh, add questions or comments in the chat section and we will be dealing with all of them uh, after the presentations from our panelists in our open discussion. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be Ms. Ariro Hajopoulou, who is a seasoned cybersecurity professional with over 15 years of experience in the industry. For the last four years, she has been the certification and standardization task leader for the Horizon 2020 pilot project Concordia. And at present, she, uh, she is leading the certification of skills activities within the Rewire project. The floor is yours, Ariro. We, we cannot ah. hear you, Argero. Can you yes. try again, please? Now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, great. Great. So, hello from me also. It's nice to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much uh, also for the introduction. I'm really excited to join for this part, but also the very interesting part uh, also that is to follow with the discussion and try to answer as many questions uh, as possible. Um, I actually liked uh, class um, introduction before because it created um, a first uh, step also to my to my presentation. So what I would like to talk about within this presentation and actually provide you first of all some information regarding the theory behind uh, assessing uh, skills in general and cybersecurity skills uh, particularly and then try to uh, introduce also the work that is being done by the Rewire project on this subject um, and the connection between what we're doing and um, what is done with um, there uh, with um, with the ECSF. So. Um, First of all, let's start a little bit with the theory. As we said, Kla already said that we are talking about skills. Uh, but first of all, before we go to the skills, we need to talk about the roles. So for anyone to implement a role effectively, and this is what everybody wants, right? Uh, it's not enough to assign a person to a role, but that you want them to um, implement it effectively so that it has the maximum value for the organization and the profession itself. Uh, you need to have, it is required that you have the necessary skills, knowledge and competence, competencies. These uh, knowledge, skills, and e-competencies can be acquired or possessed uh, because the person has a certain experience, has a, a participate in a specific academic course, has 
participated in professional training, has undertaken exams, has um, is uh, the way that he is, he or she is made up, especially about related to the skills that were um, presented also with by Clar at the last part of the presentations, the not technical ones. Uh, it doesn't matter how you came to have the skills, knowledge, any competencies, uh, what the um, assessment is actually doing is that um, evaluates, it's eva it evaluates uh, the fulfillment of these requirements, knowledge, skills and incompetencies by uh, a person. So no matter the, the source, assessment evaluates the fulfillment of these requirements and usually these requirements are incorporated within certification schemes. And certification schemes is like it's a construct which contains what should be um, what a specific role should have in order for it to work effectively. The assessment is carried out using an examination and an examination can have um, can be implemented in different ways. So it could be written or an oral, it could be practical and observational, but in any case, it is meant to measure that a candidate is competent in the things that are prescribed within the certification scheme. ANISA gave us in September 2022, the ECSF with a 12 role profile related to cybersecurity. Within each of these profiles, for example, here I have um, focused on the uh, Chief Information Security Officer role as the key skills, key knowledge and key competencies are presented. So this means that we have an indication of at least a baseline of the skills, knowledge and competencies that are needed in order for someone to be, to be able to effectively implement the role of the CISO. So that comes to answer our first, um, our first step. So in order to do the assessment, it's really important that we have this, this information that we have now from the ECSF. Um, and it's really, really important. But this is, of course, the first step in assessment. The next steps are to actually see um, how different courses and how different uh, certification schemes actually map to the requirements of the ECSF for each role and to see um, and to provide this information to the interested parties. So within the rewire project what we have done is we have two different deliverables, one called 351 uh, and one that you will see in the next slide called 341 that are actually doing trying to depict the relationship that is created between the different skills and knowledge between the different role profiles and to depict also the different certifications that could um, help into um, providing evidence that the person is competent, has the skills and knowledge and could be competent in the performance of a specific ECSF profile. So this is a work in progress and we are actually preparing tools that will allow for a person to see this information very easy because currently it's really at the theoretical level and you can see that it's very complicated. We have created these graphs where we display the relationship between different profiles like here, for example, between the CISO and the cybersecurity implementer. We can see that there are common points and common skills and knowledge and um we aim well, our objective is to provide this information easy in, in an easy um tool an accessible tool so that people would be able to uh to say i already have these skills and knowledge um because i am at that level and i want to progress to another level and because i now have this relationship between the different profiles this the the tool would actually indicate um which certifications which training courses which academic degree they could follow in order to trans to transition from one role to another or 
uh, when we talk about new professionals that are interested in coming into the uh, the cybersecurity uh, world and the sub and follow a cybersecurity related career, they would uh, the C2 would actually provide them with more information regarding um, what they need to know and what each role actually uh, provides and uh, uh, needs. This is what we have already done, and we are really uh, have finished um, the theoretical part of the implementation, and we are actually implementing now the tool. But the, the work regarding cybersecurity uh, assessment, skills assessment, and certification is no uh, is not finished. There are a lot of steps uh, that need to be implemented. Definitely, the ECSF is a very very first and important step. Uh, but uh, more things need to be defined in order to have a harmonized approach to cybersecurity skills um, assessment certification and the, um, the relevance of the different uh, certificates and credentials to the, the relevant roles. So more things need to be developed and we are happy that we have uh, a contribution by the, one of the, the pilot projects, Concordia, and we have also one deliverable that we have uh, we are uh, finishing right now regarding um, how to standardize how, how to standardize uh, this um, uh, this approach regarding uh, skills uh, um, skills um, assessment, and this means that it's not just enough to say. Uh, what skills and knowledge we need, but it's really important uh, to uh, define uh, the level for which we need the skills, uh, this, this specific skill. Because as I said before, we may have the same skill for um, the CISO and we may have the same skill uh, that is needed for uh, the cybersecurity, uh, the chief information security officer, the CISO. But it's really important to identify at which level, at which proficiency level we need the specific skill and the specific knowledge. And this information has to also be treated down to the method of examination. And this, especially this last part, and this connection between the proficiency levels and the examination methods within the cybersecurity domain has not yet been completely defined. And we are really excited to be tackling this within this, um, this um, months within the Rewire project. So I'm not going to take more of your time. As I said, I'm really excited to uh, answer any questions during the next part of the discussion, and I hand it over back to you, Mariana, and the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much, Hiro. It was a really interesting presentation, and we do already have uh, questions waiting for you afterwards. So now we will quickly give the floor to Brian Correa, who is the Director of Business Development for JIAC, the certification arm of SANS. Brian, we're all ears. All right, can you see everything and can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Hey, well, I really appreciate everybody's time today and thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored um, with these prestigious colleagues that are here today. So, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit by starting off about why certifications matter and then go into frameworks. So, you know, one of the big things about certification is it really does verify the retainment of skills and knowledge to the community. So think about it when you've taken a test versus just taken training, how much material do you really retain? So kind of give you an idea, there's actually data that's backed up that at least 70% of the material is actually retained, can be applied in the real world when a certification is involved. When it's just training, the retainment, the actual knowledge that's gained and the skills drops down to as little as 10% to about 40% on average. Now, one thing I think that's really important to note about certification is that the testing is built with international standards. So in our case, it's 1724. Why is that so important? So those questions are actually built to make sure that it's fair in the community. What I mean by that is that it's inclusive, 
that those questions are built to make sure that they're actually kind of tested to make sure there's not favoritism in the marketplace. So a good example of that was we had a series of questions that tested very well, male to female, all around the world, except in the Middle East. We had to throw out those questions simply because it did show some favoritism that's out there. So one thing I think that's really important about this, especially with the ECSF and then some of the other workforce frameworks and certification is it is a validation of skill standards. In the world of cybersecurity, we're really no different than any other industry. That could be a CPA, doctor, lawyer that all require accreditations. A stakeholder could be anything from a client to an auditor, a leader, investor, or a proposal reviewer. So with certification, there is things that are out there. So I'm going to provide a couple case studies. So it can enable business. It can be a trusted source to business in validating security team skills. So I wish I could always give the names of the companies, but they're always a little bit careful on that. So a perfect example was there was a Fortune 10 technology company that uses certifications to validate their expertise of sales engineers. In other words, they did a great job selling and teaching their own products to their sales engineers, but they wanted to make sure to the community that they could talk cybersecurity. And they were able to do that through certification. Um, it does validate team skills in such things as protecting assets, which is really big right now with everything going on in the world. You know, that could be anything from data, infrastructure, to intellectual property, skills validations. Um, especially important with the conflict that's going on in Ukraine right now. So a perfect example of that, another case study was we had a financial organization that required certifications for their whole entire team. What they were doing with that was when they were trying to explain why to use us of a financial organization, they would give tours at their forensics labs and they would showcase that the entire team had a baseline skill standards to clients. What it also does is these assets justify team scope and budget to the C-suite. One of the big things that's out there, and I think it's going to become bigger and bigger all the times, is compliance. That's compliance from critical infrastructure, shareholder value, uh, the NIS directive by ANISA, which requires everybody to be fully compliant by 2024. It's a perfect example right now of when you're looking here of certification really does build that baseline skills validation. Um, one thing that's also big is a financial reporting tied to shareholder values. So think of it in some ways as during the Great Depression when suddenly financial reporting, you're starting to see the same thing over in the world of cybersecurity. And you're starting to see more and more audits per industry. You're seeing that all the time. One thing that's great about certifications, it helps attract and retain talent, keeps your staff engaged and loyal, but it also means a lot from reskilling from other departments. So there was actually a top five company, a Fortune 5 company that uses certification as a reward to retain the best talent. So they're actually using that certification to keep those people in house. Now, one thing that's also great and probably the most important is the productivity of the security team increases efficiency and effectiveness uh, makes it more um, and so one thing that was really interesting so a perfect example was there was a large hospitality company that realized a 30 plus percent savings by training internally even with pay increases than hiring from the outside so as crazy as it sounds certification could be more affordable to incur training costs and certification costs than to hire outside consultants or even new hires that they believe are going to be rock stars and then they find out they're not when they bring them in. So why do frameworks matter? So one of them is job requisition requirements. It utilizes the task of frameworks when they're hiring, putting together job recs, things like that, the reskilling of the workforce to standardize work roles. So a perfect example was we had a Fortune 10 technology company that had multiple security companies. What was nice about things like the ECSF is they could reposition their staff quickly because they had standardized work roles as they needed to shift their mission as time went on. There's also project requirements, using tasks and skills of frameworks to identify requirements to staff projects. So one perfect example was you have a government contractor. They use um, the certification as an employee skills database 
And they also, along with that, were work experience so they could quickly execute a project. So if they needed to put on a proposal, things along those lines. Maybe one of the most important things that I you know, really appreciate about the ECSF is that cross sectors can work together because they're all talking the same language. So I think that's really important. Maybe a perfect example of that was, you know, we were all hit with COVID very fast and very quickly, and we had to be able to react. So the healthcare industry had to quickly work with the retail industry and knowing that they're talking the same language, job requirements, things along those lines, I think really do matter. Because I know we're limited in time, I'm just gonna go through a couple quick things here about SANS. We do offer about 75 courses. Our courses are actually built by practitioners in the field. That's how we do that. We actually don't hire any full-time um, instructors. We do that on purpose because we want them out there in the field. We do have a degree school. We're one of the largest master's programs, undergraduate and graduate certificate programs. Our courses are built to be hands-on intensive. They're updated up to multiple times a year to keep current. And our SANS promise really is you'll gain skills that can be applied immediately in the workplace. So I was gonna quickly go over a couple free resources. We have tons over here. We do summits, uh, in-person, virtual, three to five webinars per day. We have a reading room. We have free tools. We also maintain the community early warning system. So kind of think of us as like the news of the week. We do actually have a couple sessions coming up here. We do CISO forums. Um, they are available and they are free. They're exclusive to security top professionals. So you do have to apply for and things along those lines. We do have some coming up here in May and September. They're often hosted in London. We do have a cybersecurity leadership summit coming up here in April 18th in London. And we also have an industrial control system summit coming up here in June 18th in Munich. So if our certifications, we've actually granted 200 plus 200,000 plus credentials up to date. We have 45 um, certifications. We do certify skills to work roles. Um, one thing I think that's great about GX certification is we actually have a thing called Cyber Live where we test real world scenarios. It's actually taking the labs and testing on it. So it could be going to a VMware box, doing the following eight commands. We do update our certifications up to multiple times a year, just like our courses. We do here to educational and psychological testing, so that I talked about earlier on, including the 1724. And you do receive, if you go through our graduate program and undergraduate program through a schoolhouse, you do receive multiple certifications. That's kind of our pass and fail grade. So I wanted to finish up to kind of back everything up with a little bit of data. This is a Pearson View survey that just literally came out about two weeks ago. So some of the GIAC results, 90% have greater confidence in their jobs. 75% certifications help their careers or confidence to mentor. Now I did want to give you some certification results. This survey was done with GIAC, but also ISC squared and some other great certification bodies in the cybersecurity and IT world. So some of the results that came from that from all of us was 75% took certifications to skill up, reskill. 58% had pay increases within three months, but this is where I think it really gets interesting. 83% had pay increases within six months. 81% of employers noted higher quality work of their security IT teams by certification and actually having their team certified with a 72% higher productivity. And if you see on here, here's the website. With that, I did want to thank you for your time. We actually have an ECSF. We've done the mapping similar to ISC squared. So we do actually have that available. We do have a website that's going to be coming out here within the next couple of days. You'll see the link right here. And so that'll be able to give you information. And so it's a nice little thing that actually has interactive mapping that will be able to tell you how everything fits in. And with that, I really do appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very, very much, Brian. It was really thorough. Now, last but not least, uh, we will be hearing Dr. Paolo Atzeni, Director for Skill and Competence Development at the National Cybersecurity Agency of Italy and also professor in Università Roma 3. All the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marianna. I hope you hear me. Yes, loud I'm... and clear. 
Fine. So as uh, Marianna said, I am representing here ACN, the Italian National Agency for Cybersecurity, uh, which was created uh, just a bit more than one year ago, essentially to ensure coordination between uh, the various uh, public and private entities involved in cybersecurity. We uh, prepared the national cybersecurity strategy, and we one of our goals is to promote education and training, and this is indeed my my task in the field. Uh, as I said, uh, we we have a strategy. The strategy, as you would imagine, involves uh, protection, response, and development. And important from my point of view, it. Uh, includes uh, two enablers, one of which is cooperation, national and international, and that's the reason for which we participate to ENISA activities. And then it considers uh, training and education and awareness at, as a major enabler. And this is the thing we are discussing today. Now, um, you asked me to uh, discuss uh, in general, the assessment of skills as provided by ENISA, and then the role of certification. Uh, let me make a few comments on, uh, on both things. Uh, what do I feel about uh, the uh, ECSF framework? Uh, in general, I believe uh, it is uh, very useful because uh, uh, with the 12 different profiles and all the technical details about each of uh, these uh, profiles. There is a description of uh, uh, the needed key skills and key knowledge for all of them. So overall, if we put uh, all the content together, we have uh, a very interesting body of knowledge and body of skills, uh, which is really relevant for the cybersecurity profession. One major thing, which is uh, stated in the discussion of the profiles, but I think it is always important to emphasize, is that the profiles have a very uh, fine grain in the sense that, I mean, 12 profiles are a lot. And as discussed in the manual, uh, in most cases, jobs uh, do require a combination of profiles because especially small, medium enterprises, it is impossible to have one person or two or more person for, for, each, for each role. And so profiles are indeed uh, uh, a finer grain than what is needed in many cases. And also we know, as again, ENISA properly states in the document, that the job market is, is very fluid and therefore there is the need for, for evolution. A major point I want to make about the profiles, which was indeed also mentioned by Iro in her talk a few minutes ago, and so I want to reinforce the point, is that in many cases it is important to take into account proficiency levels for the various profiles. So, for example, uh, there is the uh, CISO profile, uh, which is definitely interesting, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the CISO for a very big company is very different from the CISO for a small one, and therefore the profile is definitely one, but the proficiency level uh, for a CISO in one context and for a CISO in another context is very diff different. Similarly, for let's say for some of the technical profiles, uh, the cyber incident responder or the cybersecurity implementer probably have uh, different proficiency levels. You probably have uh, junior, intermediate, senior experts, and so the profile just gives one dimension and there are definitely other dimensions to, uh, to, to be taken into account. And in fact, if you look, for example, to the um, e-competence framework uh, provided uh, in, in a more general context, one of the dimensions uh, you have beside the, the specific topics is indeed the, the competence level, which goes from one to five. And that's uh, definitely important when you want to assess people and their competencies. Uh, let me 
add one uh, further point to this aspect. Um, the, uh, we have experienced this in dealing with uh, um, a local administration which was trying to uh, organize uh, training courses. It is uh, often important to have a broad profile of cybersecurity officer, which obviously at the senior level would be a kind of CISO, but uh, you definitely need uh, junior or intermediate levels uh, with, uh, sm let's say, less proficiency, uh, but uh, which would be very useful, for example, in small medium enterprises, which, uh, as was mentioned by Clara in her talk, are definitely a vast proportion of the organizations uh, all over the world and in Europe in particular. And so this is definitely an important point to be to be taken into account. With respect to certification, uh, I definitely agree that certifications are important, but uh, uh, again, it is important that people understand, as it was also mentioned by Brian earlier, that there are different proficiency levels. But the, the other important thing is that uh, uh, you should, we should always understand that there are many certifications, that there is a wide picture, that certifications are useful, but uh, and also we need to take into account the fact that uh, the the market the discipline is very fluid and therefore we do not be st uh, stick too much to certification to current certifications because otherwise we we could encounter a sort of bureaucratic approach the, the dynamic nature of the field requires continuous evolution of certifications, which is which I'm sure is definitely the case with the certifications we heard today, but at the same time, it is important that everybody understands this point. Final point, uh, what are we doing in Italy with respect to skills and certifications? We are trying to define a framework uh, initially for certification of uh, uh, university programs uh, and vocational programs, uh, which is similar to what has been done in France, uh, as well as in the United Kingdom or in the United States, uh, which means uh, to give a, a sort of uh, parallel accreditation, parallel to the formal accreditation given by the higher education department, uh, to confirm that the programs uh, do, uh, are, 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 are indeed useful uh, in, in cybersecurity, which is important because there are very few programs that are indeed in cybersecurity. There are many, for example, in computer science or computer engineering, or also in other fields that do have a cybersecurity component. And it is important to be able to confirm that the cybersecurity component is what is really needed. I think uh, this is all I wanted to say, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think that with the four of you, we now have a very thorough um, presentation of the topic that we are handling, uh, but to make it even more uh, clear and understandable and um, deal with your questions who are many, which are many, and thank you very, very much for your participation. I will give my floor to uh, my dear colleague Fa Fabio Di Franco, who is currently leading the activities in ENISA on the cyber skills development part uh, for highly skilled people and the development of the ECSF. So Fabio, the floor is yours for questions and uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Mariana, for uh, giving me the floor. I see in the chat that, that there are uh, some contributions, some opinion, or some question coming from the audience. I will try to read some of them and uh, give the floor to, to our uh, panelists, this amaz amazing gender balance panel that will provide you some answer. So uh, one question that also was posted, I mean, uh, in our uh, event page is, uh, Will the assessment of the skill help employability and professionalization? I think this question was um, answered by the uh, already by our presentation of the, the panelists, so we can uh, skip. And uh, I am focusing more on uh, one because probably come from uh, a younger uh, person who want to join cybersecurity. He is asking, what is the first certification 
that we should do to enter in the cybersecurity career. This let me think, uh, there is a, a fragmentation of the certification of the training's uh, capability. So how you suggest someone who want to start a job in cybersecurity? Obviously there is not a single job. Cybersecurity as uh, we depict in the ECCF is composed by different roles. So, but how you will suggest where to start, where to look? Uh, and uh, I give you the floor to, comment uh, maybe clara do you want to start with uh, some comment sure i can and and i'm gonna i'm sure brian's gonna want to say something too but i you know i think first you have to understand what you're interested in because you can't it's cyber security is not one thing it's very broad and deep and so really, I think a great start is, and it's free, is we have a new certified in cybersecurity that actually allows you to do a little bit of a kind of overview of any of the core domains of cybersecurity. So it's not a huge time investment. It is, it is both the on-demand learning and the exam are free. So give you a chance to just get an idea of what different areas of cybersecurity are like, and then you can make a decision of where do you wanna go from there. And I think, in, and then you have a broad array of choices in terms of what certification path you can take. Um, and you can look at, there are resources out there that will show you kind of what all the organizations have. You know, certainly you can go to the GIAC website and see what GIAC has in different places, what ISC Squared has. And, you know, for ISC Squared, we're all about cyber defense. But if you want to be doing offensive work, you're going to go somewhere else and, and do something else. But I would do that kind of, it's like the equivalent of a university survey course to really look and say, is the technical side interesting to me? Because if it's not, cybersecurity might not even be for you. And then what particularly is interesting and go pursue that. Brian, you wanna to add to that? I was gonna say, Claire, you kind of said it very well. I was gonna say the same thing. This industry really is made up of a lot of different work roles, right? I mean, it can go from very technical to people don't even think of some of the like legal, for example, some of the more managerial things along those lines. We like ISC Square do have some resources that are available for somebody looking to come into cybersecurity. Um, some of the best ones we have out there is we have a thing called cyberaces.org. Uh, Cyber Aces is a free training. It will give you an idea of the different work roles that are out there. We do actually have a new to Cyber Summit coming up here. It is free if you attend virtually. It's going to be in March if you do go to our website. Um, we also have um, free training. Like if you go, like we have it down to the different work roles, down to plenty of videos, things along those lines. But you know, I believe that ISC Squared has some amazing resources. There's some amazing resources throughout the whole industry all together. So I, I say, you know, I'd like to believe that all the certification bodies really have some great ways to kind of help guide you through that process. And with us all together, I think it'll help guide you. Um, and then I would say, you know, if you have any questions, you could always feel free to reach out to me. I'm glad to help. I know, Claire, you're probably the same way. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can add something uh, to this. I think it was very, very well put by both, but I'm going to differentiate a little bit. Uh, and I, I need to, to first say a disclaimer, like I, I have been in the certification industry for almost 20 years now, so I'm definitely a firm believer of certification and everything related to that. But um, what I would like to say to the person asking and to any young professional is that before we seek, you seek uh, a certification that is, that, is um, that you could take, First of all, uh, identify what Claire, Claire actually said, identify what you want to do. So um, right now there are a lot of certifications and some of them have, have a great uh, brand name uh, and a great momentum, but that doesn't mean that this is suitable for you. So if you 
can imagine yourself um, within a specific role. Uh, let's take from the 12, but even if you can think of another one, uh, then you need to see what the skills and competencies are within are required for this specific role. And then you can build yourself to fulfill these uh, requirements. And then um, you can validate, assess your knowledge and skills and get a certificate. Uh, and that would be great, but maybe the certificate would come down the road. So if your vision would be to become a cybersecurity architect or your vision would be to become a chief information security officer, then if you're just starting in cybersecurity, I would say that you need to first train, get the, the, the skills and knowledge and then apply for a certificate. So it's a little bit, um, it's based on the answer that you had before, but a little bit different in terms of timeline. Thank okay. you very much. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, despite being on leave of absence, uh, I'm still a professor. So my, my first answer, would be if this young person is still a student, uh, he or she should probably look uh, for a broad, not necessarily deep, but for a broad uh, introduction to cybersecurity uh, for two reasons. The first one is that, as some of our colleagues uh, said, uh, you need to understand what you are interested in. But the second reason would be because probably you already have some specialty, which could be technical or non-technical. If it is technical, you could be a software developer or an architect or whatever. If you if you are not technical, maybe you are in business management or you are in law or, or, or whatever. And probably the best way to start with is to get some broad view, which can be obtained by means of a general purpose course, which could be at university or somewhere else, with one uh, caveat uh, that uh, there is some practical content, I mean, which is not just uh, something uh, very superficial. And then the suggestion would be to try to find uh, what is uh, the aspect of cybersecurity, which is kind of related uh, to your background, which could be your entry point into cybersecurity. And that could be the way to understand whether you like it. Another possibility is to look for competitions. Uh, in many countries, there are now competitions in cybersecurity. Some of them uh, have no specific uh, prerequisite. And if you look at them, it could be interesting to see whether by playing with, uh, with these games, uh, you uh, find some interest and then you can get the broad view and then you can find your specialty. Thank you very much, Paolo, for uh, your uh, uh, reply. Also, because giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, challenges. And ESA is uh, one of the organizers of the European Cybersecurity Challenge and the international one. This is mainly a competition between young people, and this is a very good way to build up uh, skills, technical skills. And there is internal competition in each uh, European country to create a team, uh, a team that will compete in the European, at the European level. Imagine like a bit of a football uh, team. We have a national uh, league, then you go at European league, and then at the International League. So this will be a good also way to prepare to follow these courses that are done at the national level. Another interesting discussion, because some people also approach me with a similar question, and they are scared about the complexity of the market, the certification market, there is a big fragmentation, there is no harmonization between different certification. And they are looking also for having some kind of micro-credential, some, uh, some way 
that have a very small skills can be in some way certified, they be assessed, so they can build motivation and they can build other skills that complement that skill at the end, they can build a, a set of skills which they can uh, perform a certain task, a certain uh, mission. So how, uh, I, I, I am wondering uh, how you perceive in this panel, this micro, micro credential is a way to uh, help younger people or people that need to be reskilled, probably more interesting for the reskilling element to join cybersecurity since we miss uh, so many people uh, working in the field. So I guess Fabio, I'll go first. Um, so a really good site that I believe that's out there, if you want to compare the certifications, and it's not put together by any of us, it's put together by the community, is a pauljeremy.com. It's uh, J-E-R-I-M-Y.com um, is a good site where they do, and they actually have not just non-vendor neutral certifications, but they do also have like the AWSs, the Cisco's, those type of certifications are also listed on there. When it comes to micro-credentials, I know that is something that CHIAC is looking at. Um, that is something that the market has requested. Um, we do do a series of cyber ranges. Some of those are actually free to the community that are out there. If you go to our website, you'll actually see a whole series of them that are out there. Um, when it comes to somebody new to cyber, a lot of times we try to start them off with training more than anything with the idea that we're trying to help that student kind of build what path they want to look to see if they're interested in things along those lines. We do also have a series of assessments that are out there. Um, those assessments are also built um, even down to see and down to aptitude of who would be best in our industry. So as crazy as it sounds, teachers um, and women actually come in much higher than men when it comes to that, when you run those assessments. But um, teachers oftentimes think very well outside the box. Um, they were not normally people you would think for cybersecurity, but they're actually some of the most ideal people. So it's interesting. And so there is a series of assessments out there to even figure out the aptitude and things along those lines. Because I think the one secret about this industry is you have to have a lot of flexibility and you have to realize the way your day starts and your way your day ends is going to be two completely different worlds. So somebody has a personality that's able to be agile and ready to kind of be able to move the flow, I think really makes a difference. I'd like to I'd like to add on to that. I, I totally agree with what Brian said. I think the idea of micro credentials cer certificates um, are very valuable. I think for one thing, it allows people to very much target their learning experience instead of having a very broad learning experience. We, in fact, have taken our certification learning and we are breaking all of it into smaller certificate programs so that people can start where they're at. So like with our cloud program, there's a cloud basics. Or, but if you already know the cloud basics, maybe you start at the setting up your cloud ecosystem. And if you got that and you really just want to optimize your cloud ecosystem and the security of it, you can start there. So I think hugely beneficial. I will say this, and this I'm saying this because I'm hearing it over and over from employers make sure that that micro credential or certification or certificate doesn't just teach you how to use a tool. Because what I'm hearing from employers over and over is people have earned certificates that teach them how to use a tool and they don't understand the underlying principle of like what they're actually doing. And that it's really critical that you understand the how, what, and why of what you're doing, not just the how to do it. So that, that would be just my one caveat, because I, I can't tell you, I don't think a week goes by where somebody isn't telling me that, well, oh, this person had all these certificates, but they don't know anything about the underlying core principles 
of cybersecurity. So that that's what I have on that one. But love the idea of micro credentialing because I think it we all don't have much time in our day and it helps us target learning. Okay. Um I, I, I will partially agree also that um, it's a really nice idea and, you know, breaking, we, we saw that um, uh, whichever framework that we, if we select regarding uh, cybersecurity skills, um, even the, the, one, the one from US uh, by NIST or the European one or all the, also from other countries, we will see that there's a great um, a great number of skills and uh, knowledge. And also, I showed you in my presentation really briefly, some of them are shared. So if you have one role, um, maybe some, um, and you want to progress to another role, some of the skills you already have, some of the knowledge you already have, and it is really nice that you have the ability to identify the gap between the two, the difference between the two, and then target the difference uh, with a training course, first of all, uh, or uh, by doing extensive reading by yourself. Uh, but first acquiring the knowledge and skill and then uh, applying for certificate that will only cover and make it the, the difference and make it more customized to you. So that for me in a concept and at the theoretical level is really, really important and really nice to have. And oh, it's one of the approaches also that we did within the Rewire project. This is why we mapped also the different um, the different roles and we broke them down into um, smaller groups of uh, knowledge and skills. It does appear to me at least to have one um, issue uh, and that we need to, to take into consideration like a challenge um, that creating too many micro credentials like uh, uh, we create one for um, incident response but we did create a different one from incident handling and we did create a different one for incident reporting or communication i don't know and that if we drill down too much within one domain and create uh, too many micro credentials then the the usefulness of certification within the, the job market is going to decrease uh, because we need to provide also certificates that say to a possible recruiter that yes we have assessed this amount of knowledge and skills and we have said that this person actually has it so we validate it so we, we give it a, a, a seal so uh, and that is really difficult to provide like an overall picture when you have little, little, little ones. It does help a lot with the training, definitely, but we need to be aware about the, the degree of details that we are going to go to the micro credentials because we need to see also that it, it is useful also for the market. And of course, it, it does not burden too much the professional also because they have to pay. <laughs> Could I just, could I like hop on to that for just a second? I know I already have my turn, but I just, I actually, I just want to say I agree with that a hundred percent. And I also think like that's, you're really also speaking to the distinction between what a certification or a credential is that is more the higher level with the more rigor at which we're evaluating skills, knowledge, and experience versus a certificate of completion. And which may, which is, you know, I did a course of study and I earned this certificate at the end. Those are different things. And maybe it's the certificates that are much more um, ripe for, for the micro level. But as you said, not too micro. Thanks for letting me jump in with that. I'm allowed to add something uh, again. In the same way as I said earlier, having uh, uh, fine grain with micro credentials uh, is uh, potentially very useful because uh, it allows us to mention the various aspects, topics, uh, skills uh, which are needed. But obviously, as Hiro said, uh, 
the excessive split of them in the end can be dangerous. And also, beside the proficiency level issue, which was already mentioned, there is one additional thing I want to mention. Uh, as you might know, my country is uh, unfortunately famous for bureaucratizing almost everything. We have uh, the legal value for degrees and whatever, so that uh, whenever you are in a public or in a government or public administration and you want to hire people, you have to take into account all the titles, uh, I mean, all the credentials with a legal value. And in the end, uh, you have people who have a long list of uh, whatever minor degrees they have, and you, you are never sure that they know things and they know how to do things. So credentials are useful, micro-credentials and certifications are definitely useful for individuals because in this way they can set a goal and they can try to reach a goal. But in after that, uh, it could become even dangerous to give them an absolute value. I mean, you need to, to balance the two things. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, uh, now I am reading another uh, uh, another message from Piot, which is say how it how it will be related to the NIST two directive. I don't know if he's referring to the ESS uh, to the ESCF or is uh, referring to a specific presentation because it was given a bit uh, time ago. But uh, if and the framework, the NISA, the European Cybersecurity Skill Framework, is sector agnostic. So don't take in consideration a specific uh, any sector, like uh, the essential services uh, that are mentioning in the NISA two directive. But obviously, then uh, we can drill a, a bit down and go at this level of detail with the with the expertise coming from this sector and understand how to map specific role that are requiring in that sector to to this uh, um, to to the specific framework uh, i want also to talk about uh, another topic which is uh, more we are talking most certification of hard skills but does also certification in some way is possible to certify soft skills because in the market Companies uh, mostly for uh, higher position, higher level position, they require a lot of soft skills in cybersecurity. And uh, I am wondering if the, the certification in, in their way how they are built are able to catch this element. So, Fabio, I guess a dollar question. Go, go ahead, Brian. Oh, um, so I was going to say absolutely. And what we do is we build like scenario based questions. There are some things that are out there to really help on the soft skills area of it. Um, we even have a cyber range that's really kind of, I would say, focused on the soft skills. But I think, you know, some scenario based stuff, um, I definitely think the soft skills are very, very important. I mean, in some ways, what's happened to the cybersecurity industry has become so focused on the technical area that we've skipped some of those soft skills. And those, I think, are very, very important that are out there. And I know Claire had explained it a little bit, but, you know, when it comes to, you know, in some ways we've done so well of teaching you the technical, we've never explained to you everything that revolves around it and why you would want to do it but just even the business aspects of everything that's around it. Like, what is a pen tester? It's great to teach anybody how to be a pen tester. It's a whole nother thing of why pen testing is important and how does it feel, you know, how does it fit into the ecosystem? Yeah, I, I would just add sort of it's that in context. So it's not, you, I guess you could test what somebody's analytical thinking or critical thinking skill level. I wouldn't. I would. I prefer the method that I think most of the certifying bodies do is we actually build that into our assessment. 
So it's not our assessments aren't just regurgitating facts. They're actually requiring that kind of analytical, critical thinking and problem solving as people answer the questions because they have to put the activities that are happening in context. And then what do they think the best answer is? Because often like more than one answer is right. And so you have to really think of the best. And those with knowing that problem solving, analytical thinking, critical thinking, creativity are the top like attributes. And I, I resist saying soft skills because I think soft makes it sound like they're not important. So I just say non-technical skills. <laughs> I, have a, I have a one woman campaign on that. But um, I, I really, so we typically are doing that through our education and what, what Brian said, it's that scenario-based learning because you want somebody to demonstrate that to you. I think even in, and we've talked, like I'll do in-person presentations and talk to people and they'll say, okay, help us with our interviewing skills. So when we're interviewing people for jobs, we know the kinds of questions to ask that the individual can demonstrate to us that they have certain kind of skills. Show us your problem solving skills. Um, and I frankly think that that's a better way to go than just straight, let me test you on your non-technical skills. Well, let me say that uh, with respect to certifications, uh, I mean, the experts have already given their opinion. Uh, my idea is that uh, in, uh, in universities, we do try, and I'm not saying we succeed, let me say we do try to cover uh, soft skill, non-technical skills by introducing uh, different uh, assessment methods, written interviews, presentations, projects, uh, theses, and so forth. Uh, clearly, uh, that's not easy, that's difficult to standardize, but that's why education is education, it's not just training. Then uh, there is uh, more focus in training and uh, certification, then probably it is possible to have uh, soft skill certifications, but that's a, that's a completely different game, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, as I said, uh, all non-technical skills are important. I mean, I was vice rector for education in my university for five years, and I absolutely understand uh, how you should pursue that kind of uh, non-technical skills, but uh, uh, there is no silver bullet pursuing them. So, um, one final point from my side. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> um, I totally agree with uh, all three. Of course, we share the same uh, the same point of view. Uh, this is why it's really important, also in the domain of cybersecurity, to think about the different skills, the different um, things that we need to assess, and think about the level. Uh, that um, corresponds to the role for this specific uh, skill. So it's, um, it's a very different thing uh, to be a cybersecurity implementer, as is described within the ECSF, and a very different thing to be a cybersecurity uh, chief information security officer. So both of them need to know um, specific things and understand uh, technical things, but the one needs to actually do them in his day-to-day -day, uh, life as a cybersecurity implementer, uh, and the other needs to oversee or audit and report. So um, it is, uh, uh, for me, uh, logical that the one, uh, the first one, uh, that I expect to have a, loyal, a lower level based on the ECSF, the five levels or the EQF, the eight levels, uh, that I would test them or her more um, technically, maybe through a cyber range and ask them to implement something within uh, the technical uh, uh, part. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the CISO, for example, then I would incorporate the 
proficiency level within the method of examination. And we really need to think which are the methods of examination we can use. Can we do demonstrate? Can we do interview? Can we do uh, the written? And how to best optimize these methods uh, given the availability of tools and the proficiency level uh, requested in each case. So this is definitely something that is missing. There's no standardization behind this. And this is why I think to my point of view, we have so many uh, credentials also that are not comparable. So we have credentials within the market that maybe sound the same or say that they fulfill the same things, but in essence, they have these so different ways of assessing it of the, the, such a different way uh, approach to examination that they check different things in the end. And this is why they're not comparable. So hopefully we get to standardize this. And then it's not just a matter of getting this certification from this certification body or the other, but actually uh, getting the uh, validation that you possess the skills and knowledge at a specific proficiency level. Thanks, Airo, for uh, your final uh, uh, comment, because giving me the opportunity to think a bit more broader, because in Europe we are 27 countries, and everyone, uh, okay, there is international certification, but there are also national certification. And I'm thinking, uh, due to this fragmentation of a certification, if it's at some point we should think of, as a mutual recognition of some professional certificate in an order to kind of to understand to make uh, to help also the students the people who are entering entry in the profession or that progressing in the in the profession to uh, reach an high quality standard level do you think it's possible is valuable or do you see more, more drawbacks I, I can start in this one, <laughs> maybe since I'm not representing a specific uh, body here. Um, I can start by saying that um, I liked it very much that the, the standard 70024 was mentioned because it is a vehicle for harmonization and comparability and in, uh, because it provides the, the requirements for the accreditation of a certification scheme uh, so that we know that the uh, the method and all the activities are carried out in a in a standardized and comparable way so that is the first one so uh, for me accreditation is the first step towards um, comparability and the second one is the adoption of a common framework also like the one that is proposed by the Concordia project, a common framework that says that I take 17024 and I make it more precise and more suitable for the certification industry. So if we have a, a general process as mentioned in 17024 and we have a general principles applied and customized to the to the certification skills, to the cybersecurity skills. And then we share also the common definition of uh, set skills and knowledge to um, and um, methods to examine them per proficiency level, then I think it's completely comparable, even if they are created by different certification bodies and are operated in different countries. So um, it just needs these elements of standardization and adoption for all. And if we all have this common baseline, then it's um, it's uh, it's the mission accomplished. Okay, if there is uh, no other reaction on this topic, I will uh, also try to reply to a question which is specific to ENISA. Is ENISA planning to extend the cybersecurity skill framework to no security role as well? For, for instance, a cybersecurity skill uh, that uh, software developer must have. So I will take this question, although I'm a, moderate, I'm a moderator. At the moment, we are in a phase where the framework has been out only for uh, 
six months. So we need to consolidate in some way uh, what the framework is. Uh, we need to see how it's implemented. I don't think we will go in the direction of uh, the software to define skill for software development because it's a bit uh, outside the scope. We have a role, which is a, an implementer, which can be interpreted de depend from the context because the implementer is uh, who implements something under the, the direction of the architecture. So this can be also a software development which implements something under the architecture, uh, the software architecture role. And uh, our framework is technology agnostic. So it uh, doesn't mention anything related to a specific tool or technology. So it can be interpreted in this way, but the, there are probably more other framework in the market that are more focusing on software uh, developing. So this is my answer. And now I have the last final question for everyone and is uh, more about practical skills. I, you already answered uh, partially to this question is uh, having a multiple questions uh, answer, which most of the certification use as a technique to be uh, to assess uh, the skills of a candidate. It's in some way you are we are only assessing the knowledge that the person has and not the skills because without a, uh, a cyber range or, or to put in practice how how the multiple questions test the ability of the person in doing something. So I was going to say, Fabio, we have, and it was very, very, very difficult to create, but we did finally get, I think, pretty close. I think if we didn't hit there, um, where we do actually have where you go in and it's a bunch of scenarios and it would be, for example, go into a VMware box and do the following eight commands. So we have built that in. Now there is a little bit of a problem with that, which is those type of what I would call, we call them cyber live questions, typically are about 20 to 30 minutes. So the problem that comes out of that is you have to have so many questions to be able to fairly to kind of evaluate the student. So you still always have to mix in some what I would call scenario based, I would say multiple choice questions, because the only other option is, is that that exam now becomes a 8, 10, 15 hour exam um, to be able to do that. But that is something that we've started doing. Um, it was very difficult for us to do that. Because there was no, there was nothing, nobody you could hire. There was nothing that was out there in the market that allowed you to do it. So we had to kind of create it internally. And I'll admit we stumbled and still stumbled, but you know, that was one of the ways that we were able to really do that. Um, and we have it now in about 14 of our certifications. And that's something else that we're looking to, I would imagine by the end of this year, we'll probably be about 20 plus. So it'll be in about half of them, um, I would say by the end of this year, but I'll admit it's not something easy and it was something we had to fight a little bit with the accreditation body on, um, just kind of explain what the purpose was and why we did it. So I'll super quickly, because I know we're getting at time. Um, I think multiple choice exams can test competence, they can. They don't always do, but they can. And one of the things that multiple, so there is a degree to which you have to understand the rigor of the assessment that's being delivered. I, I think that that is key because all multiple choice exams are not the same. The one thing that I would add though, is when you introduce different assessment types, and I actually am a fan of using multiple assessments ultimately, like if I think you wanna get the best result, the problem I have is when um, the only assessment type being used, say, is the interview. There is so much bias that is built into an interview process that I think it actually, in general, can make it a worse assessment than, say, a multiple choice assessment, if the multiple choice assessment is done right to actually test competence as opposed to strictly what do you know.
think you can add the same thing that um, it's a it's a matter of um, correct design, right? So you need to know what you're going to test it what at what level and design the, the, the method. I think it could be done. It wouldn't be a question that would test the knowledge. Uh, so we need to differentiate that into our minds. So uh, if you're testing something, if you want to see something about their ability to spot a wrong rule within the, the firewall um, or uh, do something that is technical, then you would not ask them uh, what does a firewall do and select from these four options because that would be just testing their knowledge. But uh, there needs a serious um, design process and a thinking process behind um, each question. Not everything can be tested with multiple questions, multiple choice. Not everything should be tested through multiple choice. We need to keep in mind what we're testing, for what reason, for which um, uh, proficiency level, and design the method to do that. So, and this is um, this is definitely something we we need to work more <laughs> into standardizing. As I said earlier, sorry. As I said earlier, I do see a role for certifications, but uh, not necessarily an absolute role. So certifications uh, test uh, some aspects. They can do very well. As uh, my colleagues said, uh, much more than people believe can be tested by means of multiple choice questions, but still uh, the, 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 the evaluation of uh, the quality of an individual, uh, the, the, the selection of for an interview for, for a position require different components and each of us should take responsibility for, for a portion of it. Then we should know that certifications are important. Uh, uh, they, concern, they are concerned with, with some aspects. Uh, possibly others could be tested in other ways and uh, each of us can try to do a bit more to make sure that uh, assessment uh, uh, is more careful, first of all. And second, the goal is not necessarily only assessment. The goal is to improve our processes, and this can be done in many different ways. Uh, but uh, certification and multiple choice questions do have their role in this picture, a significant one. So with this question, oh, I think uh, we don't have any more time. So I would like to thank you, all of you. Uh, was a, a very, uh, at least for me, was an interesting uh, journey. We understand from the start what is the benefit of uh, assessing the skill, how complicated it is also to build this certification, because it's not uh, simple to put some question and then test, because you have a, a, a process to test. Uh, that the process is uh, replicable, so and, and then there is no bias, uh, and then you want to test the skills and not only the knowledge, so you have to insert some question or you have to build a separate range some way in, all, in order to test these uh, skills. Also, we understand that the mutual recognition of a certification is uh, maybe is difficult to do, and we have to reflect on this. Uh, and also, we uh, my takeaway is also that, uh, for example, is not certification is something uh, assessing skills can be done in a different way, and maybe uh, this is the way that the Italian Cybersecurity Authority is going. With this, I would like to thank you, and I give the floor back to Marianna, which will introduce the next webinar. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you also to our panelists, but also to our audience who made uh, really valid comments and questions and help us uh, achieve our target, which was to make the ECSF uh, more uh, clear as regards uh, certification and assessment. Uh, let me say uh, to all of the people who are watching that uh, the next webinar will take place at the end of uh, March and it will uh, regard the CISO profile. 
Information will be made available in time in the Anissa's event page, and you can also always follow uh, Anissa's, uh, Anissa's social media accounts and the dedicated page in our uh, website for the ECSF, where we will be posting all latest uh, development and news about uh, the ECSF. Thank you very much and looking forward to see you in our next webinar. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.